Hi there, it's Richard Mar from Mars Classes again. Uh, today we're going to have a look at um, collection of data in experiments and how we can uh, display the data and then analyse the data once displayed. Now we will be collecting lots of data uh, throughout the course this year and uh, we'll um, be presenting it in tables and graphs. And then once we draw the graphs we've got to understand what those graphs tell us. So today we're going to have a, a quick look, just a very quick brief look at um, how we can collect data and how, to, how we can display it. So we'll look at a, an example here where we've got a, an object falling through um, a, a fluid. Now as it falls it's going to be accelerating. There's a few measurements we can make. We could uh, put a rule at the side and um, measure the, the displacement of the object as it fell. Uh, we could place sensors and a um, stop clock above it and measure the time as it fell. So there we'd have two, two pieces of data which we would have collected. We would have collected the displacement and we would have collected the time. Now we know um, from the rectilinear motion equations we've looked at earlier on that the displacement is the initial velocity multiplied by the time plus half the acceleration times the time squared. Now in this instance the initial velocity would be zero. So the displacement would be equivalent to half the acceleration times the time squared. So let's just put in a, a table of data that I've collected in, a, in an experiment of this nature. Um, we've got uh, the displacement every five centimeters down the um, cylinder and the time has been recorded at each of those locations. Now when we, when we uh, get that data what we can do is recognize that each measurement will have an error associated with it. For example the length measurements if we look at the rule uh, half of the smallest um, scale division would be what the error would be associated with it. Um, with the time uh, the error could be because you've got the sensors and you've got the stop clock the error for the time could also be indicated as I've done there. Now if you look at the errors, the very first displacement error 0 0.05 plus or minus 0 0.005, um, that error there, the percentage error of that one is far different to the percentage error of the bottom displacement measurement which is 0 0.2 plus or minus 0 0.005. Uh, the first one is out by 10% and the, and, the, and the second one I mentioned is only out by 2.5%. So for each of these measurements uh, we can also rather than just put the um, raw error of uh, plus or minus 0 0.005 we can uh, state it as a percentage error and we'll need that when we're doing some manipulation of data later on. So I've done that right now I've um, put the percentage errors for each of those measurements. Now what we can do with that information uh, is represent it on a graph. Now normally you would put the independent variable on the horizontal axis and the dependent variable on the um, vertical axis. In this case uh, when you do that you get a gradient uh, at each point on that uh, graph where the gradient is t on s or the time on the displacement. Now realize that the gradient is changing all the way along this graph because it's not a linear relationship. So the gradient will be instantaneous at any one particular instant uh, and when we look at that gradient and how it relates to the equation we'll see that um, well it doesn't really relate to the equation at all really does it because we don't have a, a t on s anywhere we've got a t squared on s and that's equivalent to the inverse of the acceleration. So if we wanted the actual acceleration maybe we could get the inverse of that gradient so let's just swap the axes around and we'll get this graph here and now we've got the gradient is displacement on time. But again it really doesn't match the equation because the uh, equation has displacement on time squared will give you a value of half a, half the acceleration. So it probably makes sense to have time squared um, as the horizontal uh, or the, the x-axis. So let's just put in some values there. Now when we look at the first time 0.141 if we square that it's going to be 0 0.02. And when we square that we're multiplying one time um, piece of data times another time piece of data and each of those pieces of data have an error associated with them of 3.5%. So the total error overall is going to be 7%. So you're going to have a, a time squared is 0 0.02 second squared plus or minus 7%. So for each of those uh, time squareds the errors are going to be um, double the error for just the time itself. Now straight away I look at that data and say that looks way better than we previously had. Um, let's have a look at the graph that we get. 
we get a nice linear relationship going on here. In fact, uh, very, very nice. Uh, the, all of the data points have a line that goes straight through them. There's no data point that is outside that line. Now, normally when we collect data, there might be some anomalous uh, readings outside the um, uh, exact straight line. Uh, when we look at these things, we should be indicating on our graph uh, the error associated with each data point. So we can put in what are called error bars. So I've put the error bar there for the displacement on each of the data points, and I've put also an error bar there for the uh, time squared on each of the data points. Now that means that when we're graphing this, you could have a line that looks like that green line there, which has a uh, quite a, a low gradient compared to the blue line, but it does pass through all the error bars, so that, that's a valid line that we could have drawn there. We could have also drawn a line with a, a maximum gradient that passes again through all of the error bars, um, but it has a, a lot larger gradient. Now, the blue line in the middle is what we call the line of best fit. In this instance, we didn't have to do much with it because all of the uh, data points fit on the one line. But in a, an instance where there might be some um, data point that doesn't sit on that line, uh, when we draw this maximum and minimum gradients, uh, the gradient of the line of best fit will be the average of those two gradients. And when we're looking at the error associated with that gradient, it's going to be the uh, difference of the two gradients divided by two. Okay, so that, those data um, that we used in that one uh, actually was uh, quite weird because they did fit exactly on the line. But I did show um, a graph at the very start of this presentation that looked like the one I've now got on here. Uh, I've drawn a, an ellipse around the um, X and Y errors, and that is the uh, those ellipses is where the um, the line must pass through. And again, I've done the green line as the the uh, minimum gradient, and the red line as the maximum gradient, and the blue line as the line of best fit. Now, in this case, when you look at that blue line, the line of best fit, there's only one point that we actually put down as the data point where the line of best fit is actually crossing through. Every other one of those things, the line of best fit only passes through the ellipse that um, contains the, the error bars. Sometimes, however, we'll collect data and there will be anomalous readings. Now, uh, this one here is a similar sort of experiment to the one we were talking about. I've only got the um, drop time error bars on this one and you can see each one is a bit different. When I tried to draw a line of best fit on this one, uh, the line will pass through just about all of the error bars, but there is one error bar that it doesn't pass through. Now, my assumption would be in this instance that, um, because there's no way I can make the line pass through all of them, my assumption would be that that particular reading that I've circled in red, I've made some error when I'm looking at the error associated with that reading. Okay, so the reason we've looked at this is because you will be conducting experiments throughout your coursework this year. Uh, when you're drawing a, um, a graph of your data, normally you look at the gradient of the um, data and there'll be two variables. There'll be the rise or the, the y-coordinate and the run, which is the x-coordinate. What you should be doing is always looking for where that rise on run um, relates to some equation we're looking at. For example, in a circular motion experiment you may have uh, done, where we know that the centripetal force is mass of the um, object being whirled around times its velocity squared divided by the radius. Now you might be making measurements, for example, the uh, what the centripetal force is due to the weight pulling down on the uh, cable and providing a tension. And you may also determine the velocity and square it uh, because you're, you're determining the period and, and radius of orbit. Now when you do that, what you'll find is that the centripetal force divided by the velocity squared. So if you graphed a centripetal force on the vertical axis and velocity squared on the horizontal axis, the gradient of that line, Fc divided by V squared, would be equivalent to the mass of the stopper divided by the radius. Now that mass of the stopper and radius are two things you can measure and they should be a constant value in uh, certain experiments that you will do. You could also do another type of experiment where you have the centripetal force divided by the mass and that will give you V squared on R. So uh, whenever you're doing experiments, you should look at um, what will the gradient tell me about a particular equation I'm looking at. Look, I'm going to run through lots of um, experimental type techniques in videos throughout um, this year. This is just the first one of them. I'm hoping it makes sense to you. If there's any questions, please uh, post them beneath this video. Until next time, I'll see you then.